here last year. He was here last year. Oh, perfect. So I'm going to be uh, winding up the presentation with a project which I brought last year. It's called the Food Wheel. Um, and since then, with the support of the Maker Fair and the UM, I've been uh, making a book about it to document this process. Um, so without further ado, I'll just get stuck into it. Um, okay, so basically, I'm from Australia. And uh, I've been traveling the world for the last 10 to 15 years, just doing my thing. And my thing has just been about um, it, being based out of Barcelona, starting the first maker space there, uh, really trying to find a place for myself to practice, to explore, to think about what would the world look like if I was just to think about the way I see public space and the way I see uh, city development. I'm a trained architect and I um, wound myself up in Barcelona and met a whole bunch of great people uh, at the height of the recession. We basically were, there was nearly 60% unemployment in Barcelona. There's 14,000 architects in the city itself. So it kind of breeds exploration into like, what would the world look like without a client also. Um, and so this is kind of the, the typical workspace that, uh, that I kind of create where we have large prefabrication workshops where we're doing one-to-one -one prototyping. Uh, this is in Barcelona on the left here. On the right, this is in, in Medellin where we're kind of taking industrial processes outside and engaging people into how do you make the, you know, the pavement that you walk on, um, the tree that you're standing underneath, how do you get to that point. Um, down underneath here is kind of a little snapshot of the process we kind of take, you know, starting from diagnostics with the community and then we'll go running all the way through to installation. I'm going to be expanding on a lot of this. Okay, so the project in which we all met each other um, inside our studio yeah, was this project, was the um, Fab Lab house. So this is the first and still only house that's ever been completely constructed within a makerspace or fabrication of laboratory. It was a very, it was a huge undertaking. Um, this is the project which I should have shown first. And this is kind of like the, uh, the, the snapshot of nine months of work. So after nine months of work, we put it together in seven days. So if you guys have been familiar with laser cutters and 3D printers and all these things, it's, it's you know, producing things with a very, very accurate um, production method. You know, it's exact. But then how exact is it in the real, real world? And this is what we set out to achieve. I can tell you it's the exact, if you follow it to the T, it works. <laughs> it does work on this scale, but as you know, with doing big buildings and things like this, there has to be some tolerance of mistakes and other people kind of coming into the process. But what we were kind of advocating is that the architect, the maker, if they're in control of the fabrication and the design at the same time, they can, they, there shouldn't be any errors, especially if they're the ones building it as well. So this was, this was put together with about 90 architecture students um, over the course of, uh, of two months prefabrication and then seven days in construction. Okay, so that project really, it took a lot of investment by the, the city of Barcelona, by the school, um, by the Solar Decathlon, which was the international competition of solar houses that that project was for. And so we kind of had to step back and like reflect, what does this mean? You know. When I was saying like what I thought the world would be, it's like what I thought the world would be after that project. <laughs> you know, how could we kind of change the way that we, we produce our cities? So urban prototyping is only a term, a term I found when I came to America about two and a half years ago. And I believe it started in uh, San Francisco in a Market Street Urban Prototyping Festival where it was just you know, a bunch of, a bunch of uh, community members, um, an organization, just going out and just building like park benches and uh, different things along Market Street. About, and when I, when I heard that word, I was like, ah, perfect. <laughs> it explains a lot of what I'm trying to do. Um, so the way that I define it is um, through urbanism and rapid prototyping. How do those things come together? Um, the way of life characteristic of cities and towns is, is really just that, the, the main idea of being an urban designer. How do you create that? Rapid prototyping is basically this 3D printing, this, uh, this uh, laser cutting, how you can rapidly produce an object. And it's often very much computer controlled. So how do these two concepts come together? So this is kind of my definition of it. And then the projects I'm going to show you is how we kind of merge, as we've been merging that. So this project here um, is in Medellin, Colombia, 
where we were doing some workshops to explore like these concepts of making and building one-to-one -one objects. And the city of Medellin saw a couple of workshops and decided to commission us to do a city-wide project. That means 21 urban projects, all done at the exact same time, all done with diagnostics with communities, engaging maker spaces, and executing them. So then what we, what, we said, what we ended up doing was creating a lot of these kind of micro uh, projects. Um, you can sort of see up here on the, on the middle, middle right, a skate park, which we made. Um, down here, you can sort of see these, um, these uh, water hole covers. The principal objective of this project was taking construction waste found everywhere around the city, specifically in public spaces themselves, and then crushing it down and pouring it uh, into CNC cut uh, formwork, uh, which you can kind of see at the bottom here. Then we also scaled up in that same project to do larger scale projects. Um, the, the engagement of making with architecture students, with community members, and the, and the city itself ended up with pro some successful projects like this in which after it was done in the community, they kind of uh, went to the local government and said, no, if you build us some kiosks, we can start a business for ourselves. So it started to spur on economic development. All these things were surprises to us. We were literally just a group of guys just trying to you know, prove a point. How can you make things inside a, inside a maker space, turn it inside out and make it in the, in the city? So when all these things started to happen, it kind of blew us away a lot. You know, like, there's, there's something here. If we're given the opportunity and we execute it, you know, the, the natural kind of investment of people in that process starts to, you know, starts to really you know, create the, the invisible aspects of the city, you know, cohesion. Um, social in inclusivity, you know, all these really important things we, we're trying to, you know, always trying to do in our, in our daily lives. And so the projects got bigger. Um, this project here is in Venezuela, in Barquisimeto. And the spaces I showed you at the start of what my spaces look like when I'm building things, we actually put them inside the, uh, these little mountains here. So in these mountains here, there is um, construction equipment, there's a CNC machine, and this is how we left it uh, about, I think, two or three years ago. And the, or even before the crisis happening in Venezuela, they have a great social public space program. And so they started this project, and now the community has taken over it, found their own funding, and it's still going today. So then we, we started to spread our wings outside of uh, South America, and we were invited to, to Ethiopia to start to think about how you could create a connection between food and place. And so this is, this is the start of a, a story which I'm going to bring all the way to Miami and to the project I brought last year with the food wheel, because food just started to become the way that we could connect with people immediately. And it became very much the passion of what we were doing and then has developed into you know, what I specialize in today. It's like food, place, and how you can create those links through temporary pop-up um, uh, installations. So this one here is about promoting um, uh, the preservation of food, uh, eliminating food waste. Because there, in Ethiopia and the marketplaces, there is, there is a, a, a problem of waste. There is a lot of food there. And a lot of it's getting wasted because there is, it's after two, three years of investigating it, it's, it's down to basically the way that um, it culturally uh, people buy food. They don't want to see, same, same as us, we don't want to see um, rotten food next to a, a good piece of fruit. We just kind of, we just leave it and just go to the next door. So this, this was about how we could prototype different spaces, like this pavilion, uh, different um, mechanisms, and the bottom left is a, is a drying rack, or the same one that's on the top right. Um, on the bottom, bottom right here is a, you can see the little glimpse of a cart to present fruit, but to have air coming through it, so it, the fruit can breathe and not rot. I mean, that's the tip of an iceberg of a really great project that we started to do. Um, in, in cohesion with that, we were also doing um, uh, art installations. And these installations we did every year with a budget of about $1,000 for material. And in, this is in a city called Girona, just outside of Barcelona. And this is the only project that we could get from inside Spain. And so we used it to think about how could we um, you know, take a, 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 the cheapest length of wood and make a, uh, make a temporary pavilion. 
Um, this kind of really taught us about you know, materiality and started to think about, okay, not everything has to be done to the uh, buying the top shelf equipment, hiring the contractor to build it for you. You can start to take it into your own, um, into your own uh, control. So the, the beautiful pieces, and we did it for uh, five, six years, um, every single year, every spring. Um, it's called Tempest the Floors, if you ever are intrigued to go find it out. It's a beautiful flower festival that takes over that city. Um, so this project here was a, was a culmination of all those explorations in which we were invited by MIT to do a public space project um, in Cambridge. Now a lot of you know that MIT is a, it's a, you know, it's extremely uh, well-known institution. It's seen as like the, the forward thinking and development of technology and making and a lot of the things that we use in our own maker spaces and fab labs come from you know, things that were happening at MIT inside the media lab. But then they never did a community project in their backyard. <laughs> so that's why they even asked us, was like, well, we do all these things behind closed doors, could you do something um, out in the community? And so what we did, so what we did was is that we created a, um, a structure like you saw in the past. Um, it was made inside this, which is a mobile fab lab. Uh, which mm -hmm. They have had this for, I think, since the, the Bush administration. <laughs> They've just been sitting in a car park. Um, and uh, when we saw it, we just had to inflate the tires, everything was working, and it just basically um, you know, started to think, how could you make something that's not just educational, but make a, an actual one-to-one -one project? So then, out of it was a smart agriculture sculpture. So what happens is, is that on the, the top here, you see some lighting that's connected to remote sensors that measure soil moisture, temperature, humidity, light, this is all controlled by microcontrollers that you can make in your maker space. I'm sure there's a lot of people around here that are making um, or even selling little um, uh, microcontrollers like mini computers to control uh, um, different inputs and outputs. So our inputs in, in the moment is environmental sensors and our output was irrigation and lighting. So what happened was is that there's this dashboard here. You could, the, the citizens could log on through the dashboard and then they could say, see, when they control what they could see, meaning if there is a, um, a plant uh, needing water in the middle of this uh, sculpture, all the lights around it will flicker on and off, which is kind of what you can see here, these lines that are going through. So it's, it's very subtle. We had something much more uh, on the bottom. You see some a bit more brighter, a bit more fluid, but they didn't like that immediately. <laughs> it was something that really gave them a lot of visual kind of pollution. So the... <laughs> And it's core to all our projects, like these ones here that you see, it's all modular. It all is can be designed in place to take any form. So that's how we get, a, not get away with it, but how we can develop things on the spot and change it quickly to meet the, the, the demands and all the changing demands of the neighbours and also city inspectors who, you know, who are oscillating between saying that this could not be left there because it's a hazard and something that we could just change right in front of them and go, is this better? And they're like, sure, <laughs> it works. So that was a really great, a great um, kind of experience. And so after that, um, I was invited to come to UM School of Architecture um, to accept a, an Emerging Practitioner Fellowship. And this was basically a, a research teaching position to just become and reflect on all the work I had done about 40 to 45 um, installations you saw up to this point, and, and figure out what is it for? You know, what does it actually mean? And um, in the first few weeks, we did some parklets. Um, have you guys heard of Parking Day here? Yeah? No? Well, I don't think, did it happen this year, Tom? No. No, I don't think it happened this year, but it's a great event. It happens around the world. It's basically <laughs> um, two parking spaces uh, merged together to create a thing called a parklet. And the parklet is a temporary park um, inside those parking spaces. And so when I came, me and my students, we, we did a couple of them. And um, it was a great experience. So all these projects you see here are designed and built within 10 days. Um, this is kind of, the drawings were done afterwards, uh, the, 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 the 10 days. But um, you can sort of see here, this is in Wynwood. So this, this project here, is about a, um, 
a, a moving bench that kind of uh, goes around a, uh, a inversion of what Wynwood is uh, in relation to urban agriculture, meaning that there isn't any, and <laughs> the, the, out the, the inside of everything is a white wall, and so the students and I decided to invert it and then start to introduce plants as like a mirrored um, uh, installation. So these, these projects were, when I said before about food being the central role, that, so when I started to reflect on how we would like to move forward, was about how you can promote food and urban agriculture in neighborhoods. And so this, so then this project here was another one that was done at the exact same time, um, in which was a modular system. Uh, again, uh, this was done out the front of uh, Winwood Diner. So all the projects were paired with a, a local business. So how can uh, people uh, serving and eating inside the uh, Winwood Diner could interact with this parking space in front of their, uh, of their project. So there's many restaurants with the exact same condition in Miami. So I pushed the students to really think about, okay, how does this work on a, on a neighborhood level? How can you make one installation that's modular and then with the participation of, of different people, including a makerspace, including a, um, uh, community members, start to spread throughout the, the neighborhood. So it becomes like a, almost like an urban parasite, you know, really like latching onto different um, restaurants, which you can see there's an immediate value to the restaurant to have uh, a, a temporary uh, space in front of their building to, where people can go. And, um, and this one here was to pick herbs. So you could bring, you know, they could do a pairing with the, with the installation. So this is uh, some, some details of how the, some of the herds are being presented. So there's, there's often like a, an artistic element to this, I think. You know, obviously a, um, a, uh, a clear ball with a herd is not going to last forever in, in the, Miami, uh, the Miami temperature, Miami climate. But the whole idea is about you know, pushing you know, how you see and how you interact uh, with this with, uh, with food and with uh, growing things. So then that brings me to, um, to this project. So last year, um, the, the Maker Fair and uh, University of Miami, um, and a project at the University of Miami called the uh, Marketplace, um, funded uh, this project. And what happened was is that we brought it here to the Maker Fair, and then we um, were building it at the school, and then brought it to different uh, places around Miami and kind of deployed it. So the food wheel, um, is basically a, a, a giant rolling um, installation. And uh, the idea of this installation was how could you could take all the things that we've been doing in the past and make it mobile? You know, what, how could that work as a pop-up public space? Everything's inside of it. You can wheel it to any location and then it pops up. Um, and so, so these are some images from last, last year's Maker Fair. And so we also changed some of the design from the Maker Fair by people coming for the first time to use it. Students could see like how it was uh, working and, and they can make changes to that. And so this comes back to what I have here, which is um, instead of uh, doing more and more of these projects, I decided to, uh, to publish a book on that project. Um, and so the books I have literally just hot off the press today. Um, and uh, it's been a great experience because it's all those other projects you saw, the 40, 45, they're the only documentation you see. And that was done like maybe a year after the project because we were just doing things quick. We were like, no, let's just build, let's just do the project, let's get it done, we'll get the photo. We didn't really produce drawings, we just produced the 3D models. And those 3D models talk directly with the fabrication machines uh, that you're seeing around here today. So I took the time to, to do some drawings. And so what UM gave me the opportunity to do was create a program. And so this program was called Urban Prototyping, Creative Placemaking. Um, it's a research design build project in which it follows the same stream as my other projects were doing, but in a way that not just architecture students, but uh, high school students, it's, 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 it's scalable to uh, how you can engage young people, to take part in building something one to one, which may seem a bit a bit crazy because at the end of the day, like not everyone has the construction experience. But with using these machines, using CNC parts, using which I'm going to show you in a minute, um, it can come together with unskilled labour. But it's more about someone like myself or an instructor or a master builder 
being there to just, and it's very simple the way it does, does come together. It's literally a rubber mallet. Um, it's designed properly. It can, it can go together with very, very minimal kind of fixings and screws and, and glue. Um, just to go back to some of my other projects, those modular wooden elements, those were all put together without any fixings. So that was relying um, on how the wooden elements fit together. So that means about the tolerance of how you cut stuff, it basically goes together perfectly like a puzzle. Um, that in itself takes months and months to develop, but it's, it's worthwhile because then you, you're producing something that someone can pick up a piece of wood, just walk over to the structure and just, just put it in place and, and start to change the form. Okay, so the objective of this is that design, art and technology can serve as tools for civic participation. Um, the Marketplace project was a, um, a prepared food market that uh, the university was doing in West Coconut Grove. I believe now the project's moving to Buena Vista, I, and I think there's another one happening somewhere else, but that's all about how do you create a, a, um, a community-driven, prepared food market for community members. So the food wheel was produced, uh, was, was conceived, so how does that, how does that um, action work? Because as you guys know, walking to any community, you go, great, oh, you guys need this. Uh, we're going to make it, and you're going to love it. It doesn't quite work in that particular manner. Um, so uh, we, we started the, well, the UM started the West Grove project like that, ran into a lot of brick walls, and I was like, look, why don't we just make something that you can use anytime, you can literally wheel it to the location, unfold, create a pop-up market, create a pop-up engagement, uh, exhibition, whatever it is that you need to do to portray that idea and make an incubator within the community. That was the idea of Food Wheel. Um, so the ideation started like very, very early in my explorations of, uh, of rural and industrial America, and I started seeing all these things, and it just fascinated me because like all these things that you could find, and I think Virginia Key uh, near the the mountain biking, there's like a field of like twenty or thirty of these. There's a lot of these around. Um, I think there's one on US one that's been sitting there for like the last year, year and a half. So they're kind of, they're not precious. They're giant wheels that use it to, to roll a conduit up above. So the question was, could we propose a new mobile architecture topology with using this wheel? That was the challenge. Um, and so I found one of these wheels, which is in the middle, the middle roll, and then basically just left it in the classroom. Well, not inside the classroom, it's huge. <laughs> but just outside the classroom and just, and it started a process in the, in the studio in which the students just had to go free, free reign. I gave very little direction at the, at the beginning. And so what this book documents is that kind of free reign and where we're looking at urban activators in which how can a wheel uh, work? How could it be used as a device? Something could swing open. How it could be used to expand? How you could use it as a section? You know, how you use a rotate. I mean, these are very fundamental kind of ideas, but it's, it's all it takes. It's just a very fundamental idea. It's been all about the execution of this. So then, these are some of the ideas. Um, inside the book, there is, I think, 50 or 60 of these ideas pared down from almost 120, which I made the students do in like maybe two weeks, because it's just quick. Like, don't you think, just, just how can a circle or an eight foot circle turn into a, um, an activation? You know, how can you just quickly take these ideas? Not worrying about how it's built, but like what are some ideas like this is a Russian doll type of thing. Um, this is an inflatable um, birdcage, it seems, for kids to go inside. Um, this is, some of these you'll see in the, um, you may recognize some components made it to the food wheel, but it's about you know, ideation. Uh, and so these are some, some more. This one also uh, made it. Uh, well, actually, it's quite funny. There's only one student who did one design that said this was rolling, which was kind of the whole idea from the beginning. But it's kind of nice how that there's a lost in translation. I don't know if that was my accent, but it was more the fact that, you know, that, that they took the freedom to that next level, which was great. Uh, what's the time? Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, then we, uh, we started to think about, like this is that entire food wheel exploded with all the different pieces. 
Um, this is the, 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 the cutting patterns. So what we use is a plywood sheet that is four feet by eight feet. Uh, and then you probably saw an image like this earlier in the presentation with the, um, with the house. Those sheets there in, from metric, um, is about eight feet long by 30 feet long. So in this, this uh, and that machine was extruded in a very, very big machine that we custom made for, this is with, uh, made for a, a machine like this, which is a, um, a this is slightly oversized, but uh, it's how you take a standard dimension that you could buy this at Home Depot, uh, and then well, you buy 40 of them, and then basically these 40 sheets, once they're all cut out, they turn into the assembled, they're assembled in different pieces into, into the wheel. So in the book, there is the whole process of this, this is just one snapshot of it. Um, we then started to like very clearly, um, which we've never done in any project before, is take it apart so you can see every little element of what it is, it's specified, it's almost like an instruction manual of how you could do this in the, in the future, um, and which is something which I've never done in the past, and I thought, well, now is a good time to do it. You know? This is going to be a program, or hopefully it becomes a, a, an enduring program. You know, how can we document this? And I think that's very important. Um, it's something which I should have done from the beginning. Um, and so this is some more, I think we can see it compiled on the inside, and this is all the furniture elements that fit, you can see how it fits around the wheel. So these elements here, uh, which I think last year no one used it actually as a table and a chair, but they used it as rolling, as, as rolling rockets, which are fun. Um, and this is what the kind of final kind of uh, project looked like. Um, we uh, the the two sides kind of flip flip in. Um, the, the the tray there kind of flips up into here. That that large circle there, the door that flips onto the other side. And this is the other side here, which is kind of an exhibition or information um, point. I mean, the other side is very clear. It's the food, the food prep. The, um, I'm not sure you've got by this image, but everything on the side of that uh, wheel is herbs. So the people cooking inside serve their food through, the, uh, through that slot. And on that bench, you pick up your food and take some herbs and, uh, and you're on your way. And that's... That's it for the, pre for the presentation. You know, did you have to study about the community, about their you know, preferences or their traditions? I mean, going to Ethiopia and working there is probably very different than working in um, Venezuela. So what was the amount of preparation or was just your concept so open that it was easily transferable anywhere? Um, it's a very good question because I think there's different degrees of it. Okay, for example, Ethiopia being a very far-flung destination was, was our local partner. Um, who worked on the house with us actually. So she did a lot of the preliminary work. And so when we arrived, the, what you saw, we made all of that in the spot. Um, but I think it's about, you come with an idea, like a, a premonition, normally that premonition gets squashed and thrown in the trash a few times, you go to the trash, take it out again, you know, you can go through that process. But I think it's really about finding that, the, the thing that we notice is that invested community member. That mother who's like the queen of all the other mothers, the, the person that is just the, the, the busybody, like there's always one or two of them that are the keys. Once you find them, very easy, it happens in days because they just tell you that doesn't work, that's stupid, try again. And that could happen within half an hour because they just, <laughs> they, they are the, the, the insight, basically. Yeah. Is that your question? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just being kind of open, 
to like, I would just go and hang out. Like, that, those were marketplaces. There's one in every single neighborhood in, um, in uh, Addis. And so we just went and just walked. And then looking like a foreigner, <laughs> speaking like a foreigner, you tend to attract uh, people um, very, very quickly <laughs> um, on that. Um, I would like to say it's, it's always as flawed as that, but not really. Like say the project in Colombia, in Medellin, when we first really did that on a city scale, that was, that was intense because we're dealing with, um, you're dealing with uh, the local uh, organized crime boss. You're dealing with the paramilitary group. You're dealing with the, the pasta. You're dealing with like, people who are very strong leadership men who are sitting at the top of a pyramid, and you need to find them. You need to get to them for their blessing. They didn't care what you're gonna do. They're like, fine, foreign money, great, do it. Like, they, they, didn't, they didn't really digest it so much. Um, but I think, um, I think once you find that, you know, the, it's really the mothers, let's be honest. That's it, like, once you find a group of mothers, they control everything, yeah. <laughs> There's another question. Yeah, I was wondering about the weatherproofing on uh, the wood. You yeah. You can cut the wood, obviously, things shrink and expand with the humidity. Uh, you get around a lot of that by using plywood. Yeah. But you still need to seal that up, so, so yeah. how did that happen? Yeah, so no, th for this one, this project, yeah, yeah no, that was... Uh, uh, we put a lot, a lot of sealer on this, and it's a constant up upkeep on the wood. It's a, it's a constant sealer. In in basically, in fairness of making it out of wood, because I know that was kind of everyone looked at it and was like, it's never going to last more than six months in Florida. Which is, I mean, they're correct. Um, that the the marketplace that was this was meant to open was there was going to be a semi covered area, which was meant to be stored in and then rolled out on on a day to day basis. Um, it wasn't meant to be kind of just left in the field. I mean, like it is here. Um, that's kind of the, the thinking behind using the wood. But on our other projects, I guess we're in much more temperate climates than, than, than Florida. But it's right, I mean, wood does decay, wood does um, age. Um, a lot of these projects, um, except for the, the ones that we're making um, in, um, in, uh, in South America, which is like concrete and, and uh, crushed uh, construction aggregate, all of them are only lasting like maybe a month, yeah. tops. Yeah. So inside that wheel, like, um, what is stored in there permanently? Unless obviously you don't want to put the herbs in there; they're going to die. Yeah. But uh, I'm just wondering, where where are the other things stored at when it's not in use? <coughs> I mean, everything's stored on the wheel. Uh, let me see here. So that um, that platform there kind of folds up, and that's locked into uh, this bit here. Folds up and locks into. To the wheel itself. So then, uh, instead of this irrigation system, it basically just attach a, a hose to a, a pipe and it's automated. Um, this, that there folds inwards. Uh, all the furniture fits around the wheel, which is, which is here. Like all of this goes right here because it's empty um, when it's uh, for service. And uh, when, when you finish service, you put all the furniture back. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Um, I'm just curious about like one thing. How do you keep like the furniture from falling off when you're like, like how does it stay there? <laughs> Very good. Not one of my students was thinking about that till we actually put it on there. <laughs> Luckily, I was a little bit. But it's very true. It's the uh, it's with cable um, straps. You know when you where you're sh putting something in the back of a truck to hold everything down, you put a ratchet strap. That's how this all works. It's a it's a ratchet strap. Um, but I, I would say for the food bill 2.0, that will be our primary kind of <laughs> stepping off point because the straps are great. Uh, when we wheeled it down the, the street here to the Maker Fair, we we came across a few stones that wasn't that nice with the straps. <laughs> Um, but I think this is the, the whole idea of, of urban prototyping. Right? The prototyping is that. You know, it's about just going out and making it, finding out the mistakes while you're doing it, and then going back to the drawing board. And the reason why I can do this full time is that I, I, when I speak to clients and I speak to people who are funding these projects, that's the way that they buy into it because they're not putting a few hundred thousand, a million dollars into making something like this. They're just putting a 1% uh, of their budget they have in their, in their project to just, no, no, just do it, just show us. 
And that's what these projects are like, you know, just to, to demonstrate the, 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 um, you know, the point or that engagement with, uh, with, with the city. Yeah, okay, so anybody have any last question? All right, so we have about 15 more minutes until the next talk. James is gonna step outside to the Step and Repeat banner with the Laker Fair logos. Mm -hmm. If you have any other questions you wanna pick his brain about, you can go out there and meet with him. And then come on back, but 15 minutes later, we have an amazing yeah. next talk up, so. Yeah, and feel free to come and have a look at the books yeah. uh, that were made for DCC.